Deep breaths, deep breaths, okay? Deep breaths. Breathe in. Breathe out. You don't believe you're crazy, do you? No, I don't think I'm crazy, no. You will remain incarcerated until the date of your death is scheduled to occur. This is Tyrone Johnson, who's facing charges for murder in Florida. Did he say you hurt my mommy? <laughs> Is that what he said? In 2018, Tyrone tragically shot his then-girlfriend, Stephanie Willis, and her 10-year-old son, Ricky. Now in police custody, Tyrone is shocked at his actions. Can you stand on one leg by yourself? Are you sure you're okay? This is gonna happen, all right? I'm gonna take your, your left hand out, put it on top of your head for me. Deep breaths, okay? Deep breaths. Breathe in. Breathe out. Eventually, he calmed down enough to tell his side of the story. So you're on the ground, you, and, and she's yelling at you, and what am I doing? He's in there, too, and I'm telling him I'm not doing anything to your mom. Okay. She pushed me off my road. I'm trying to leave, and he was on this shoulder, and I pushed him off. When you say he's on that shoulder, what is he doing? Like, to what you? are you doing to my mom? And I go, I'm not doing anything to your mom. Is he hitting you? No, sir. He was just on my shoulder, asking me, "What am I doing to his mom?" Sir, <laughs> whose blood's on your hand? It's hers. Her blood. Okay. And once you start firing, did you fire too? I just fired, sir. You just started firing. So you're, now you're sitting on the ground on your butt, firing. So they're basically standing up. Let's say you're sitting on the floor and they're standing up. Is that, is that, is that accurate? Yes, sir. And she had the PlayStation. Just she's, she's holding PlayStation like and, this? And I just firing. You just started firing. I mean, were you doing this? I was just like, firing, sir. Or were you firing at her? I was just firing. Was she looking at you? Was she facing you when you were firing? We, we, I'm sure we yelling. I'm sorry. We were yelling and was trying to talk to my dad at the same time. Okay. According to Tyrone, he was fighting with his girlfriend over the TV remote when he accidentally shot her. In court, prosecutors disagreed with his version of the story. The step Tyrone Johnson took was a chance to end this, was a chance to show mercy to that little boy. Each step he took was a chance to stop this whole thing. But each step he took was a choice that he made to go find Ricky Willis. A choice he made to kill Ricky Willis. Shell casings, we have blood. We have holes in the wall. In the little boy's room. The shell casings are right there in front of the bed and they line right up with those two holes underneath the bed. However, Tyrone's lawyers took another route. Not premeditation. Tragic situation that got out of control. The victim's family told the court how Tyrone's actions affected them. Grief we feel is never ending. Every minute of every day. We will never watch him grow up, never see who he would have become. Now it's time for Tyrone to address the court. I am truly remorseful and deeply sorry. Despite his apology, Tyrone found time to accuse the state of improper trial. The state knowing nothing about me would have you believe that before I knew was a vicious man who went hunting for human life. Eventually, Tyrone learns his sentence. Suffice it to say that a precious child is dead. This murder was heinous, atrocious, and cruel for those acts. I sentence you to death. Tyrone is still serving his life sentence in prison. However shocking Tyrone's reaction to his sentence was, how does it compare to the prison break actions of Michael Brady, who was in court on multiple charges, including murder? I stabbed him like four to eight times. 
Michael was in prison for attempted murder after he shot at a North Carolina state trooper. However, while in prison, Michael masterminded an escape plan that resulted in the death of several correctional employees. One, what is the address of your emergency? Uh, Pastor Tank uh, Correctional Institution. We need you guys here right now. Okay. They beat them with hammers and with scissors. They, they beat them with hammers and stabbed them with scissors. Michael and one of his cohort set their plans in motion. Then they moved to the stockroom and set it ablaze to cause a distraction. But they were not done. They pretended to be loading a cart and claimed another victim. With the smoke from the stockroom filling everywhere, officers rushed in to see what's going on, and that's when they noticed what was happening. Meanwhile, Michael and his gang have nearly reached the outer wall, but before they could make any more headway, they were arrested. During interrogation, Michael didn't hold back. Now in court, prosecutors showed the weapons Michael and his group used. Hammers, uh, scissors, there was a, like a wooden two by four with some nails it looked like in it. And detailed the graphic scene. That man, Michael Gray, beat that man, George Midget like he was trying to bust concrete. Other witnesses testified to the brutality Michael and his group committed. Officers and just people just, for lack of better words, plugging, plugging holes with, with wounds and gauze. And with gauze. It was like a bloodbath. Um, literally when I stepped in and I stepped in and I slid trying to get in because the whole, the whole elevator floor was nothing but blood. You got inmates on the line of weapons. You want to see? Blood um, bad. You know I mean, they were messed up. While the heinousness of Michael's actions are undeniable, the true shock lies in his behavior during the sentencing process. When it was Michael's turn to talk, he made no pretense of showing remorse. I'm up, here. I'm, I'm up here to tell the truth. You can ask me anything you want. I'm going I'm to tell the truth. How it was, whether it hurts me, whether it helps me. I don't care about that. You don't believe you're crazy, do you? No. I don't think I'm crazy, no. And you do know the difference between right and wrong? Yes. So you know murder is wrong? It's a different name for a death, but yes. At the end of the day, escape versus these people's lives, and you chose escape. Yes. In less than 40 minutes, the jury returned a verdict. The jury unanimously found the defendant, Michael Brady, second to be guilty of first degree murder. Michael is currently in a Colorado prison, awaiting his death. However, let's compare the jaw-dropping reaction of Michael to the shocking behavior of Neil Simpson, who's facing multiple charges, including felonious assault and murder in Ohio. really never had the misfortune of meeting more foul piece of humanity at this point in my life. In 2007, Neil had fatally shot pizza shop owner Dave Kowalczyk during a robbery and fled. But one of Dave's employees called the police. Dave, police, fire, ambulance. Someone just shot someone. Are you with a person? Yeah. Are they breathing? I don't know what I was doing because I don't want to get shot. In court, Neil was found guilty by the jurors. However, during the sentencing phase, Neil let the jurors know how he felt. Ironically, the act of mercy came one week after Simpson spit on members of the jury and cursed at them, just as he was scheduled to take the stand to ask for leniency. Before he was sentenced, the victim's family took the stand. My brother was a loving, kind person. He did anything in the world for anybody. For one family, they get to see a son, a grandson, a brother in prison. For the other family, they get to visit a brother, brother-in-law, uncle, and friend in the cemetery. The prosecutors also reserved some choice words for Neil. Nothing more than a coward. Somebody that covered his face and walked in and shot a defenseless man at close range. That's the true Neil Simpson. The bravado he shows in court, spitting on jurors. I've really never had the misfortune of being more foul piece of humanity at this point in my life. Finally, it was Neil's turn to address the court. I know in their heart, they think I killed their family member. I'm sorry for your loss, but I had nothing to do with your family member's death. I didn't kill anyone. I'm not spending the rest of my life in prison for something I didn't do. He insisted he was innocent and offered to be a martyr. 
life without parole don't sit well with me. Uh, so I'm going to request the death penalty. And I have two ways I prefer to be murdered. One is to be crucified from the courthouse uh, for all the sins, all the convicts throughout the world. And uh, the other way would be stoned to death by the victim's family. And that make them feel better. Luckily, the judge disagreed. On count one, no sentence by the court due to election by the state of Ohio. On count two, life in prison without the possibility of parole. Count three is 10 years in prison. Neil will spend the rest of his life in prison. However, as we saw Neil's discontent with his sentence, it brings to mind the strikingly similar response of Joseph McAlpin, who was facing multiple charges, including murder and cruelty to animals in Ohio. Aggravated murder is prior calculation and design. Well, that's part of it. But what's the difference between prior calculation and design to set up a date for a man to be put to death? In April 2017, Joseph robbed a car dealership and fatally wounded the couple who owned the business and their dog. Mr. McAlpin thought he was smarter than everyone else and he thought he could, you know, uh, plan this crime and get away with it. And he just didn't realize how easy it is to catch individuals who commit this type of crime. In court, Joseph decided to represent himself and cross-examine witnesses whose voices were changed to protect them. When do we know if you're lying? When do we know if you're telling the truth? How can we distinguish that to understand that? Right now, I'm telling the truth. How do we know that? I don't got no reason to lie. You didn't have no reason to lie in the beginning. I did. I was scared. Scared of what? You. Why would you scare me? And your family. Why would you scare my family? Because if you just did those innocent people like that, you would do somebody else like that. He even called on his family members to testify on his behalf. He had a hard life growing up. He seen a lot of things he shouldn't have seen as, as a child, but he did. Eventually, he rested his case. I'm not standing up here to say, Hey, you found me guilty. I didn't mean to do it, please. I still stand firm on my innocence. And for the first time, he showed emotion in court. Aggravated murder is prior calculation and design. Well, that's part of it. But what's the difference between prior calculation and design to set up a date for a man to be put to death? However, before he was sentenced, Councilman Mike Poletic had something to say to him. From day one, this was never about vengeance. It's been about justice. I stood there on that Good Friday night as they carried out Mike and Trina and Axel in body bags. I was there. I saw the pictures from the corner. I saw what this individual did to them, the viciousness of the crime. He is a demonic killer, a demonic killer. It's one thing to rob somebody, but it's another thing to do what he did. The prosecution also reserved some words for him. Uh, Your Honor, uh, pursuant to the Ohio Revised Code, we believe that consecutive sentences are necessary to protect the public from future crime, not only to punish the offender, and that they would not be disproportionate to the seriousness of his conduct and to the danger he uh, poses to the public. Now it's time to learn his sentence. On Thursday of last week, the jury found that the aggravating circumstances outweighed the mitigating factors beyond reasonable doubt, and therefore found the verdict of death to be appropriate. Despite being handed the death penalty, Joseph didn't give up his claims of innocence. My name is Joseph McAlvin, and I was falsely convicted for the killings that happened in 2017, April 14th, in Cleveland, Ohio, at the Mr. Carr's two car lot killing. What you're about to see here is actual proof of my innocence, showing that the prosecution withheld evidence from my case that was show that I was away from the crime scene during the time the murders were being committed. Joseph is awaiting his death in prison. Just when you thought you'd seen it all, another convict surpasses Joseph's wild courtroom display. Enter Thomas Nuff, who's in court on multiple charges, including theft and murder in Ohio. You know, when you show emotion and you say you're sorry, they say you're lying. When you don't, you're a psychopath. Thomas was on parole when he murdered John and his girlfriend Regina following an argument. Police say he stabbed a couple in their home and left the bodies behind. Pair police say was stabbed multiple times by Knuff. We learned today in a press conference with Parma Heights police that Knuff was released after serving more than 15 years in prison for a string of break-ins throughout Northeast Ohio. 
Well, during his time in prison, he became pen pals with Capo Bianco. The two wrote to each other for more than 10 years, police say. It was Capo Bianco and Mann who even picked Knuff up from prison when he was released in April. Following investigations, Thomas was arrested. Now, in court, he speaks about the crime. You know, I offered a written to uh, him and John's family that, you know, I am sorry for how things turned out. And, uh, you know, when you show emotion and you say you're sorry, they say you're lying. When you don't, you're a psychopath. I understand that, you know, they need somebody to hate, but, uh, you know, I'm, this isn't over. And, uh, you know, I'm going to pursue every avenue to get the truth out. Now it's the turn of the victim's families to take the stand. While I'm not versed in all of your life's choices or actions, I've seen two glaring failures you've made. You chose, as I previously mentioned, not to peacefully exist in civilized society. My heart is broken. I don't know if I will ever repair. I miss her every day. She will not get to see her sons get married. She will not get to call grandma. The prosecutor addressed Thomas. People that have common ordinary jobs and start their own businesses. They were broken into because he was desperate for money. So there are also other victims here. Classic hair studio is a victim. Spa and nail salon. That woman closed her business out of fear that that would happen again. Even the judge wasn't left out. I noted that the one consistent theme was that um, Mr. Knopf was sorry for how things turned out, but I never heard him say that he was sorry for his own actions. Um, not once uh, did I recall hearing those things. Finally, it's time for Thomas to learn his fate. Pursuant to Division D1 of this section, which is 2929.03, there was, of course, a jury recommendation that the sentence of death be imposed. The court finds by proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the aggravating circumstances the offender was found guilty of committing outweigh the mitigating factors. Therefore, on count two, the sentence of death uh, will be imposed upon the offender. I have to live with this for the rest of my life, so wherever I'm at, it doesn't matter no, to me. My life's over. Thomas is awaiting death in prison. However, while Thomas's behavior was shocking, it's nothing compared to Steven Lorenzo, who wanted the death penalty and is facing charges for multiple murders in Florida. So I'm asking you to give me the death sentence because that'll be more comfortable for me to live out my lifetime. In December 2003, Lorenzo assaulted and murdered two men, Jason Galehouse and Michael Wachholz. For 19 years, he maintained his innocence until late last year. Two of them hunted down their victims at gay nightclubs with the hopes of turning them into their own personal sex slaves, admitted to drugging the victims with a date rape drug, torturing and then killing them with an electric saw. Now in court, survivors tell the court their lucky stories. At any point in your interaction with the defendant, did you consent to any type of sexual activity? No. Did you consent to having... Um, a zip tie placed around your neck? No. Did you consent to being penetrated with um, the large plug that you previously testified no. about? Were you conscious at least for some time there in the living room? Yes. Before the And at some point, do you wake up? When I awoke, I did, at that time I didn't know where I was, but I was, I had duct tape over my eyes and mouth. And were you in a seated position? I was face down. However, Stephen, who was representing himself, had some questions for the survivor. Um, in that chat that we had together, did you mention that you were going to visit some of your friends? No. Who were the friends that you were going to meet? Josie and Dwayne. Do you know who Josie and Dwayne were in the gay community? As far as what did they do? What the, was Josie and Dwayne the main drug dealers for Tampa? Uh, I, I, the, the witness answered he doesn't know. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Were you going to an after hours party with Josie 
and Dwayne to have a drug party and sex party with uh, the offender. No. Did you go to the defendant's house to have sex with the defendant after we did some drugs at the bar? No. I have no more further questions. Thank you. Now it's Stephen's turn to explain what happened. I appreciate that, yep. but it begs the question that I have, and that is why. I didn't actually meet Mr. Galehouse. Mr. Galehouse had met another gentleman, the gentleman I invited back. Said, okay, let's all go back to my house and we'll party and have a good time. Mr. Schweiker um, got carried away. He lost control. We realized that the kid was going to probably call the police on all of us. So we had a power and we said, this kid can't leave. So that was why the decision was made. His explanation didn't help his case. His family members of the victims told him how his actions had affected them. I can tell you right now I am sick of my stomach just to have to look at your disgusting face. Yeah, that's right. Make a face, you creep. You should be dead already, as far as I'm concerned. You put me through holy hell. Not only that, my health, because now I've got stage four breast cancer. I'm not saying that you caused all of it, but you caused plenty of it with emotional strain. And you pulled away and you laughed about it. Laughed. What the hell is wrong with you? Eventually, County Judge Christopher Sabella accepted Stephen's guilty plea. I'm going to find that there is a sufficient factual basis. I am going to find that Mr. Lorenzo's plea of guilty to two counts of first degree murder is entered into freely and voluntarily. But before he is sentenced, Stephen has one more request. It appears that everybody is ready to proceed to sentencing. Oh, Mr. Um, Lorenzo, yes, you're raising your hand. I'm seeking the death penalty. It's in my best interest, basically because um, it's a comfort. It's mine. I'll be living a lot more comfortable than I would in the federal system, living on death row, believe it or not. And, uh, and of course, that may sound selfish, but I've lived in a private cell for the last five years, and I'm going to have a private cell on death row. At my age, I want to be comfortable. I want my privacy. That's what I want. So I'm asking you to give me the death sentence. Now it's time to learn his sentence. In the words of Miss Pam Williams, from one Italian to another, ti condanno a morte. That translates to, I sentence you, Mr. Lorenzo, to death. Stephen continues to wait for his death in prison. However shocking Stephen's actions were, how does it compare to the actions of Mark Wilson, who's facing charges for double homicide in Florida? In August 2020, Mark murdered his girlfriend's nephews, 12-year-old Robert Baker and 14-year-old Tatian. Attorney RJ Larizza announced Wilson's case will be, in fact, a death penalty case. Now, back in August, Wilson apparently admitted to killing 12-year-old Robert Baker and 14-year-old Tayton Baker. The medical examiner says both boys died from blunt force trauma to their head and deep lacerations to their neck. We will be seeking the death penalty based on these two brutal and violent murders of Robert and Tayton. The murder weapons were a hammer and knife. Crime scene was so bad that even the most seasoned Putnam County deputies had a hard time processing what they saw when they entered the home. That this is truly one of the most horrific crime scenes that I've ever seen in my life. In court, the mother of the kids told the court what happened. Uh, are you woken up at any other part in the night? I am, at four o'clock. My son, Robert. I walked from my room all the way down the hallway into the game room because my son taken had my phone that night. Um, my four-year-old is with me. Um, I started seeing blood on the ground on the other side of the pool table. Um, so then I started getting closer and closer and seeing more blood and I ripped off my son's blanket because I thought it was like he was a, he was a picker on scabs. I didn't realize how much blood it was at the time because I just opened my eyes. But when I ripped off the blanket, that's, I, you, it was everywhere. It was covered in blood. And I ran over to Robert and I'm screaming at him to call 911 and I rip his blanket off. And all I can remember is his, his head flipped forward and then it just banged back up against the wall. Um, 
and he was the same thing soaked in um blood the cops who answered the call also took the stand he was, in he was distraught he was saying a lot of different things however what i caught out of it was they're inside they're dead i asked if there was anybody else inside the residence he said he didn't know in the living room on the floor correct and fair to say there was a lot of blood there was on the walls I, I can't recall where exactly all the blood was, but there was a significant amount of blood, at least on the floor. The neighbor was also called to address the court. And that's when Sarah came knocking at my door, um, opened up the door, and I smiled at her, and she was in her nightgown, and she said, she said, Debbie, Debbie, call 911. I think my kids are dead. She was terrified and panicked, and I remember her nightgown was ripped, and then her little Landon came running behind her. Perhaps the most intense moment was the testimony of Mark's mother. It says, Mom, I can't do that. And I said, why, Mark? Did you hurt those babies? Mark's left arm went straight down. His head went sideways, and in a voice that was not his own, he says, yes, Mom, I did it. Finally. It's time for Mark to learn his sentence. And then committed two truly horrific murders of innocent children. Tayton's death in particular was especially cruel and undoubtedly painful. The court finds insufficient basis to override or disagree with the jury's recommendations, finding that the prerequisites of law have been met and that a jury of his peers has unanimously found death to be the appropriate sentence. Mark is currently in prison pending his execution. However, this wasn't the only time a convict freaked out during their sentencing. Take, for example, the case of Granville Ritchie, who's facing charges for the murder of nine-year-old Felicia Williams. In May 2014, Felicia disappeared after her neighbor and godmother, Ebony Wiley, met with her friend Granville in her house. The police were soon called, and Granville and Ebony were brought in for questioning. Any, any idea where this girl may be? I wish I know. Can you tell me how you know this? The house that they're standing in now, and if you look to the left, I used to stay in that house. Unfortunately, Felicia's body was discovered in Tampa Bay the next day. This intensified the investigation, and the police wanted to speak with Ebony in Granville again. You know Ebony? I know Ebony, um, I would say, we went on to a week. Maybe he came out of that room, man. That little girl was gone. Telling you to say that he wasn't there? To say that his mom was there? Yes. Say it was my mom with you. Okay. I said, well, okay. And that's why I said I was in the shower when she was in her room. Why lie? I got scared. I don't want to make it feel like I was an unfit godmother. Following investigations, Granville was arrested. Now, in court, the prosecution tells the court. He put his hands around her throat. He strangled her. And then he took Felicia's lifeless body and he threw it like someone would throw a bag of garbage into the cold, dark waters of Tampa Bay. Next was the state attorney. Felicia Williams' life meant less to this man than his sexual desires to violate her. To prove their case, the prosecution called on their main witness. Why is it that you ask Granville, are you responsible? Did you do something to her? Because she didn't show up. If she walked away, if she don't ran down the street, she gonna show up. I told them that I lied. And they was like, what you lied about? I said, I left her with Trevor and he wanted me to go and get some weed for him. And then when I came back, she wasn't there. They also pointed out that a distress 911 call came from Granville's phone at the time Felicia was missing. Hey, what's Eric's 911? Then they rested their case. He used deception. He used lies. He used manipulation. He pulled strongly at the heartstrings of Ebony Wiley. Despite the prosecution's stock of evidence, Granville's lawyers disagreed. It is not crystal clear that Granville Ritchie harmed Felicia Williams. When Felicia Williams is missing, 
There's no signs of a struggle in that apartment. There's no DNA evidence left by Felicia Williams that you would expect. No hair, no skin, nothing. They lined up their own witness and insisted that Granville Ritchie remains innocent. In your final call, ask Cal what if charge the defendants give the first degree murder as charged. But before the sentencing, the family members of the victim were given a moment to tell Granville how his actions had affected them. I just miss my grandbaby. He meant the world to us, and he discarded her like she was nothing. I've waited 2,310 days for this day to come. The only thing I regret today is that I cannot ask for his fate. And that would be for him to be hung, for him to feel what my daughter felt. It was a touching moment, and the judge wasn't left out. My heart breaks for you as a mother. Absolutely breaks for you as a mother. The most shocking part of the proceedings seemed to be the statement from Felicia's father. I forgive you, bro. That's how strong my God is. I come in smile at you today with no harm or ill wills towards you. You my brother. You made a mistake. But you got time. You got time to get right with God, bro. Finally, it's time for Granville to learn his fate. There will be no corporal redemption for you. And what I mean by that is of your, your physical being, your person. You will remain incarcerated until the date of your death is scheduled to occur. May God have mercy on your soul, Mr. Ritchie. Granville is currently awaiting his death in prison. However, when emotions run high in court, the actions of Granville and Tiffany Moss leave us questioning sanity itself. Tiffany is in court for the murder of 10-year-old Imani Gabrielle. Prosecutors say Moss deliberately starved Imani as punishment while taking care of her own kids. 10-year-old Imani weighed around 30 pounds when she died. In 2013, Tiffany starved Imani to death. Prosecutors showed evidence of abuse and starvation. I look at uh, PS7 and identify that. It looks to be the shoulder area of one of her arms, Amani's arms, and with bruising on it. In court, Tiffany represented herself. She is representing herself in this capital murder case in court. She's not putting up much of a defense at all so far. She did not give an opening statement as the prosecution flew through 11 witnesses. She just sat there. She didn't say anything. Now it's time for Tiffany to learn her fate. Considered the circumstances surrounding that murder and found that aggravating circumstances exist. With respect to count one, ma'am, I impose the sentence of death. Tiffany is currently on death row. This is Joseph Zeeler, who's facing charges for murder in Cape Coral near Tampa, Florida. In May 1990, Joseph murdered 11-year-old Robin and her babysitter Lisa in a Cape Coral apartment. The victims were discovered bloodied. He was arrested in 2016, a staggering 26 years after the cold case murders. If Joseph had any remorse, he hid it very well. Uh, There's a paper right here Mr. that doesn't Zyler. hide from you. Mr. Right Zyler. Here. I still see the body of 11-year-old Robin Cornell with the hand, with the hair of her the killer. The the jury will step out. The blonde Mr. hair Zyler. of her killer. Today, Please. Zyler. Well, nobody would listen to me, so I was trying to defend myself. As if that was not enough, he had some words for the victim's mother. And then it would have to follow that your DNA would have stayed viable for five. The, hold, let me finish my question. For, if it was January, February, March, April, May of 1990, and then, well, okay, I don't want to make it a compound question. Your DNA would have still been there five months later. Yes. And that's because they're pigs and they don't wash their sheets, exactly. right? Exactly. You know that? Well, I, I, I assume that. Just like you're assuming that I, that... But just so the record's clear, when I said they're pigs and they wash their sheets, that's what you said. Absolutely. He strongly disagreed with the attorney. The DNA witnesses, did you hear them say that they actually did retest NB32? That they actually took the sheet, recut another sample, and had another analyst do the same test? Did you hear that? Yes. So the retesting was done. 
I believe FDLE is siding with the prosecution. Of course they're going to say that. Okay, and their opinion on that was that Jan Cornell was excluded from that DNA. I don't think she was. I think that if it was listed, that's the reason I asked for it to be retested, because I don't believe that. Finally, the jury had had enough. Madam Clerk, please publish the verdict. We, the jury, unanimously find that the state has established beyond a reasonable doubt that the first degree murder was committed in a cold, calculated, and premeditated manner without any pretense of moral or legal justification. Yes. Jury verdict as to, to death penalty. Having unanimously find that at least one aggravating factor has been established beyond a reasonable doubt, at least eight jurors recommend that Joseph Adam Zeiler should be sentenced to death. Yes. Therefore, the court concludes that under the laws of the state of Florida, the defendant has forfeited his right to live. But Joseph has no intention of going down quietly. Oh. All right. All right. Joseph is still serving his sentence in prison. Attacking your own attorney in court is shocking, but how does it compare to a serial killer that took the lives of his own family? God, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is Timothy Jones Jr., who's in a South Carolina court on charges of murder. Timothy is accused of murdering his two-year-old son, Gabriel, seven-year-old son, Elias, one-year-old daughter, Abigail, and eight-year-old daughter, Mira. Now in court, the witness, Under Sheriff Smith, details what he saw. Uh, it was three, two patrol cars, a black Escalade. As I was walking up to the black uh, Escalade, I noticed a, a foul odor, and uh, I asked, what is that smell? And they said it was coming out of the vehicle. As he went into details, Timothy looked on, unmoved. It was a smell of decomposition. It's a smell that you don't forget. I had a flashlight, and I, I walked around the Escalade. Uh, I believe it was a can of muriatic acid. There were several cans of bleach. I saw a five-gallon bucket in there that looked like it had a roll of tape and a saw and maybe a mask or something. I saw spots, a pretty big area, that appeared to be where they had poured bleach onto that carpet. And while I was looking through there, I saw a spot behind the driver's seat of what appeared to be blood and was later determined to be blood. The victim's mother was next to testify. Sorry. I heard my son crying. And I asked him what was wrong. My son, Natan. He said, Mom, I didn't mean to. And Tim was going on in the background, and you could have killed yourself, son. And then got mad at me because I was trying to calm my son down. What did you say to him? That it was okay. And Tim got mad and, and said, why do you always have to defend the kids? He was more the disciplinary, I was not. I thought that my son had gotten the point and that I was tired of hearing my kids crying all the time. He told me to shut the f up and hung up the phone. I tried calling him back. Dave Mack, an FBI agent, also took the stand. Uh, September 7th, we were going to drive out to Mississippi and attempt to interview Timothy Jones. All right, can, can you walk us through what happened? I questioned a ton about four outlets that he blew. After a series of not getting any favorable responses out of him, I tried to use more harsh measures to just try to get out of him what was going on because I didn't know what he was doing. I seen four destroyed outlets. Uh, is it for me, him? Was he curious? I just didn't know what was going on. I was trying to make sense of it. I just PT'd his ass till he couldn't handle it. Tried to crack him on butt a couple times to get something out of him to tell me what was he doing. Right. What's his motive? But Dave wasn't the only one to take the stand. Today, I believe Wednesday, we did try to contact some emergency contacts that were in the power school system. 
There was a, she would have been the, the children's great grandmother. She was very alarmed because they were supposed to come for a visit that long weekend and they had never shown up. Describe to me what you were telling me earlier about where you disposed of your children at. They're in some wooded road, log truck looking thing off on the side. You, you do what once you, once you get to this location? Put them in the bags and put them off to the side. Okay. Tell us about Natan. I began to try to saw a leg. Only now did some sign of emotion appear on Timothy's face. Oh, I can't do how, how far did you get? Maybe about that far in. I was like, I can't do that. I can't do that to him. Okay. So you, you did not cut his leg off? No. What, what did you do with his body? I just put him in a bag and said, I gotta sit you guys over there. I said a prayer for him and walked away. Next, the prosecutor displayed Timothy's confession. You walk us through what happened. I questioned a ton about the four outlets that he blew. After a series of not getting any favorable responses out of him, I tried to use more harsh measures to just try to get out of him what was going on because I didn't know what he was doing. I seen four destroyed outlets. Uh, is it for me, him? Was he curious? I just didn't know what was going on. I was trying to make sense of it. I think I worked him too hard, or maybe it was a combination of the electricity. I know electricity takes electrolytes out of your body. Uh, something happened. Mm -hmm. It was out of the ordinary, and he would tell me. If I would have known it, I mean, I, I would have got him medical help whatnot, but I don't know what he did, and he didn't tell me. I didn't see any burn marks on his body, so that's why I didn't rush him to the hospital. This time, Timothy recovered some part of his heart. So, Natan was, was dead, and then what happened? And then I followed suit with the other four. And how did, how did you so kill that them? that was with my hands. With your hands? Can you describe what you mean by with your hands? Around their neck. Around their neck? Okay. <laughs> the prosecutor also showed that Timothy had made plans to get rid of the body. The, um, the paper says, number one, it says head to campground. It says melt bodies. It says saw and bones to dust or small pieces. And then there's, there's a word I can't make out and it says by something and it looks like plant. When the victim's mother addressed the court again, it was heartbreaking. Nothing justifies, nothing justifies what you've done. There, there's nothing you could possibly say that would justify what you've done to my babies. However, the defense attorney had another angle. Is he still talking about the voices? Why is he still talking about the delusions? It's still psychosis, and it's still a break from reality. Despite the defense attorney's efforts, the jury wasn't convinced. As to indictment 188, Mira, guilty. As to indictment 189, Elias, guilty. As to indictment 190, Abigail, guilty. As to indictment 191, Gabriel, guilty. As to indictment 195, Natan, guilty. Eventually, Timothy was sentenced to death. And the murder of five children, 11 years of age or younger. Now I recommend to the court that the defendant, Timothy R. Jones, Jr., <clears throat> be sentenced to death.